need someone in time of grief, someone my child to be. Jesus, I choose for me, gives relief, he is the best for me. If you or I were to buy a piece of farmland, one of the things that we might have to do is cultivate the soil. And the reason that we cultivate the soil is because we want it to be rich, we want it to be useful, we want it to be extremely productive. When it comes time for a harvest, we want the most bountiful harvest that we could possibly imagine. But that doesn't just happen. It takes time. It takes attention. It takes diligent labor in order for ground to be productive. And my friends, the same is true when it comes to our hearts. Every one of us should desire to have a heart for God. We should have a heart that longs for God, that yearns for God. A heart that wants to do everything it can possibly do in order to be well-pleasing in the sight of God. But such a heart does not just happen. It has to be cultivated. There has to be time. There has to be attention. There has to be labor put into our hearts if our hearts are truly going to be right in the sight of God. Wasn't that the question? that we just ask in the song, is thy heart right with God? A question that all of us need to ask ourselves on a daily basis. We've begun a series of lessons entitled, Cultivating a Heart for God. And last week we began talking about some of the elements that we need to incorporate in our lives if our hearts are truly going to be right with God. The first thing we notice is this. You and I must have a true perception of ourselves. By that we mean this. We need to see ourselves as we really are. We have a tendency to see ourselves through rose-colored glasses. We have a tendency to look at our lives and rationalize and justify and make ourselves look right when oftentimes we may not be right. We may mention the fact that what we really need to do is this. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. The second thing that we noted is after we've done that examination, then you and I need to be honest about our spiritual life. Folks, we need to be honest about our relationship with God. Am I hot with God? Am I cold in my service to God? Is my service merely lukewarm? Am I where I used to be when I became a Christian? Am I better? Am I worse? I need to be honest about those things. How do I feel about the Scripture? How do I feel about what the Scripture teaches? How do I feel about my local congregation? I need to examine my life as far as my service and participation in the body of Christ. Folks, we have to be gut honest after we've made an evaluation of ourselves. And then we notice thirdly, that in order to have a heart that's right with God, God must be our supreme love. You and I cannot love anything over and beyond the Almighty God. I love my wife, but I cannot love her more than God. I love my children and my grandchildren, but not more than God. I love my job, but not more than the Almighty God. I love to have fun and pleasure, but I cannot love it more than I love the Almighty. The Bible says that we are to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that is the very first commandment that God has given to man. There are other elements that you and I must incorporate in our lives if we are going to have hearts that are truly hearts for God. And we're going to talk about three more components this morning. First, if you and I truly have a heart for God, we must develop a fear of God. When we talk about fear, there are two types of fear that we can talk about. One of them is negative. It involves dread and it involves apprehension. In other words, it is an emotion of being scared and afraid of God. Folks, that's not the kind of fear that we want to develop in our hearts for God. 
We want to be individuals who want to be near God. We want to be individuals who are in the presence of God. We want to be individuals who long to be with God and live with Him forever as a loving Heavenly Father. I don't want to quake and tremble because I'm scared to death of Him, but I have to fear Him. And there's another definition, and it is a positive fear. It involves an awe and a respect. Notice the definition. A reverential awe for the Almighty God. And over and over and over in the pages of God's Word, you and I are taught to fear God. Deuteronomy 6 verse 13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve Him and swear by His name. And Psalm 2 verse 12. The psalmist said, Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. The wise writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 3 verse 7 exhorts us, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. I love what is said in Proverbs chapter 23 verse 17. It says this, Be thou in the fear of God all the day long. Folks, you and I just don't come into this building for a couple of hours and show our honor and respect to the Almighty and then leave and act as if we don't reverence Him anymore until Wednesday night again. I am to be in the fear of the Almighty all the day long. As long as I am an individual who, admi who believes in God, I fear Him. Well, I just got turned on, didn't I? It's unbelievable. I'm screaming at myself now. <laughs> the question that we need to ask is this. What causes a man to fear God, folks? What is it that will make an individual bow before the throne of God? What is it that makes an individual understand who he is and that he is not truly worthy of the Almighty and when he falls before Him, he falls in reverence before the great God of heaven? There's two things that will cause me and you to fear God. Number one, an understanding of who God is. And I'm afraid that we have missed this point. And part of that is the fault of preachers and teachers of the gospel of Christ. We've neglected to teach individuals about God and about who He really, really is. Because when a man comes to an understanding of who God is... He is drastically going to change his view of the Almighty. In Isaiah 45 and verse 5, the Bible says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Now listen to this. There is no God beside me. Folks, there is one and only one true living God. He is all-powerful. He is majestic. He is just. He is holy. He is righteous. He is everything that you and I are not. And when we understand who God is, we'll come into His presence with a deep respect for God. But secondly, if you and I are going to fear God, we're going to have to appreciate the works of the Almighty God. We're going to have to appreciate what God has done throughout the history of mankind. When you see God in action, when you see God working on behalf of man, the only thing that you can do is step back in wonder and amazement and awe of the majesty and might and power of the Almighty. It makes you appreciate exactly who God is. Psalm 111 verse 4, He hath made His, watch this, wonderful works to be remembered. Just mention some things about God. Creation. Even if individuals do not believe in creation, they know about the story, don't they? Oh, you're those individuals who believe that God created everything in six days. I sure do. And it manifests the power and the greatness and the might of a holy God is what it does. Oh, you're those people who believe in Noah and the flood. You bet I do. God destroyed this world and for 40 days water 
was above the tallest mountain on the earth. And all humanity except the family of Noah was destroyed in that flood. And on and on we could go talking about the wonderful works of God, can't we? He has made His works to be what? Remembered. Folks, when I believe in God who He is, and when I believe in God for what He's done, guess what? I tremble before His throne, don't I? Fear is a motivator. That's why we need to develop fear for God. Folks, when I really understand who God is and what He's done, guess what? It propels me to do certain things. I would encourage you, at some point, go and do a study of fear in the book of Proverbs. It's a wonderful study. Notice some of the things that are said. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1, verse 7. We go just a little bit further in Proverbs the 8th chapter and it says this. The fear of the Lord is what? To hate evil. When I understand who God is, when I understand how holy and righteous He is, and that I want to be like Him, guess what that does? That moves me out of the practice of evil and iniquity. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. According to Proverbs 14, 26. I know who God is. I know exactly who He is. I know how great and powerful He is. I know how faithful He is. And guess what? I put my full confidence in the Almighty. Why? Because I fear Him, knowing His being. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, the Bible says in Proverbs 14 and verse 27. And again, we are told in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 6, By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. If I want to make man holy, if I want to make individuals appreciate God, if I want to make individuals trust in God, then guess what I teach them? I teach them to fear God. One of our problems, guys, in the churches of Christ is we don't fear God. We think we can act however we want to act. We can serve Him however we want to serve Him. We can do whatever we want to do and God will accept me because I've been baptized wrong. It's not true. You and I, if we're going to cultivate a heart for God, must develop a fear of the Almighty. Point number two. If you and I are going to cultivate a heart for God, then you and I must crucify ourselves. I find it interesting that the crucifixion of self is a theme of the book of Galatians. I've got to do some more study on that. Corey, he may preach on it tonight and just blow me away. But the Bible talks three times in that book about crucifying self. One of them is found in Galatians 2 verse 20 and we have put these words to a song and young people sing it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul says, I crucified myself. Paul said, I put myself to death and yet I'm still living. Folks, a cross of crucifixion is for the very purpose of dying. Paul didn't die physically, but he died spiritually. That old man of sin, that old man of Judaism, that old man that was out to destroy the church, that old man that was out to satisfy his own lusts and his own desires of the flesh, Paul said, I've put that man to death. He then turns to Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, and he says this, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Not just Paul, but anybody who says, I am Jesus Christ's is supposed to have crucified the flesh. 
Paul then says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, that the only place in which he glories is what? In the cross of Calvary. But watch how he ends the verse. By the which I am crucified under the world, and the world is crucified unto me. Unbelievable. There comes a point in our life when you and I have to slay the old man of sin. If I were to ask you, are you a Christian, and you raise your hand, here's what you should have already told me. I've already died to sin. Isn't that true? The only way for you to become a Christian is to die to your sins, isn't it? And that's involved in an act that we call repentance. I no longer want to sin against God. I no longer want to violate the will of God. I want to serve God. I want to do things His way. So He crucified that old man of sin. We even buried him in the waters of baptism. And a new man arose. And that new man could be called Christ Jesus. Living in us, didn't He? But here's the sad part. That old man of sin... Doesn't like to stay dead, does he? That old man of sin seems like he wants to constantly raise his head in our lives again. And what I found interesting was in the pages of the New Testament, over and over and over again, guess what we have? We have examples of individuals struggling with sin. Individuals who are Christians. One of the very first examples is Ananias and Sapphira, is it not? Members of the church. Individuals who bring an offering unto God. But yet, when they bring it, what do they do? The Bible says they lied unto God. They kept back part of the price of the land. Oh, they wanted to look like givers, didn't they? They wanted to look like individuals who had just sacrificed everything for the cause of Christ. And yet, they lied to God. I don't guess anybody in here struggles ever with a little lie or two. We all do, don't we? What about a man by the name of Simon? Known first as Simon the sorcerer. Peter and John come down to Samaria and they are imparting gifts of the Holy Spirit under members of the church. And oh, Simon sees that, doesn't he? And guess what he wants? He wants that ability. And he offers them money so that he can do what they could do. Peter said, Thy heart is not right in the sight of God. I find that interesting because it applies to our lesson, doesn't it? You see, folks, when old self rises again, my heart is not right with God. We find another illustration in the Colossians. Colossians 3, 5, Paul tells the Colossians, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What does he mean by that? Crucify them, kill them, slay them. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to members of the church. I thought they already died to that old way of living. They did, but guess what? Paul knew that it is easy for us to be tempted. It is easy for us to practice those old ways of sin. It's easy for the old man of sin to be resurrected. And guess what Paul says? Kill him again. Sometimes he's got to die again for us to be right. What about old Demas? Paul says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. 2 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. What about those of the dispersion? Paul says, I, or Peter says, I beseech you therefore, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from what? Fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Why did he tell them that? I thought they'd already crucified all of those flesh fleshly lusts and desires. I thought if you're Christ, that's what you do. You do, but guess what? Occasionally, they raise their head in our lives, don't they? Find another example in Diotrephes who love to have the preeminence among the church. 3 John verse 9. And just go to the book of Revelation and read about those seven churches of Asia. And at least five of them were struggling with sin, folks. Deep-seated sin. Thyatira was one of them. Had a woman in their midst by the name of Jezebel. There you go. That's what I want to see in the church. Any Jezebel walks through them doors, I'm going to start shaking, aren't you? 
But Jezebel was there. And the Bible says this, She hath made the servants of the Lord to commit adultery and to sacrifice things unto idols. Here was a woman who brought this church into the depths of immorality and even into the practice of idolatry. You see, the old man of sin can raise his head. I bet if all of us were honest, all of us struggle with some form of sin and iniquity in our lives. There's something that we battle. There's something that we fight. It may be little or it may be big. It may seem like nothing or it may be grotesque in nature. But it is a fight that we fight against the old man of sin. And guess what we have to do? Crucify him. So the question that we ask is this, how do we conquer self? That's a toughie, isn't it? And what's interesting is, the answer to the question is simple. And I'm about to give you two points in answer to that question. And it's simple. And yet, when you leave the building and you try to put it in practice, here's what you're going to say. This is hard. And the preacher said it was simple. No. I said, my answer's simple. The practice is hard. Because you see, there's two things we have to do. Number one, we've got to get our thoughts right. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Paul says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing which exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Now watch this. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Folks, there's where it begins. Now remember, the mind is what? The mind is the heart. The mind controls all of our actions, doesn't it? The first thing I have to do is I have to know the will of God and then I have to make dead certain that every thought that I think is in harmony with the will of the Almighty. I've got to throw out the bad. I've got to throw out the sinful. I've got to throw out the fleshly. I've got to throw out that which carnal. And I've got to focus upon this is the will of the Almighty God. But secondly, I've got to conquer self, don't I? If there were ever a Christian that you and I look up to, it's Paul, isn't it? If there were ever a Christian who exemplified Jesus Christ, it's the Apostle Paul. And yet Paul says this, but I keep under my body and bring it, my body, into subjection, lest that by any means, when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You see, there's times when we have the right thoughts, don't we? We know exactly what God has taught. In fact, we can even quote the passages and yet we still what? We still sin, don't we? And it's at that moment that you and I have to control the flesh. We have to control the body. And I have to bring it into subjection to the will of the Almighty God. My friends, if you and I always think right, and if you and I always do right, guess what? We will not have any problem with self. But there'll be people who'll leave this building today and guess what? You will deal with yourself this very afternoon. You know that? You may be dealing with yourself right now. But if I want a heart for God, I've got to crucify self. The next point. If you and I want a heart for God, we have got to develop cross awareness in our lives. What do you mean, Vic? I never heard that before. Cross awareness. All I mean is this. As Christians, our minds need to be constantly focused on Jesus Christ and His sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary. 
Don't you love to read the story? There's a song we sing, I love to tell the story. But it's even fun just to read the story, isn't it? The Bible says in John 19, verse 17, And he, watch this, bearing his own cross, went forth unto the place. The place that is called the place of the skull, which in the Hebrew tongue is Golgotha. Oh, we could spend a day on that verse. But listen to what it says. And he bearing what? His cross. There have been millions of people, folks, executed on, the, on crosses. Did you know that? Millions. The Romans were masters at it. Sometimes when they conquered a city, they would line the streets with crucified people. There were two others crucified the day that Jesus was crucified. But watch this. When I say, the cross, whose cross do you think of? I think of the cross of Jesus Christ. It was His cross that He bore. We turn over to Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of what? The cross. We're not talking about something that's pleasant. We're not talking about something that's nice. We're not talking about something that's just a wonderful thing to reflect on. Folks, we're talking about something that a man died on. He died on the cross of Calvary. And when he hung there, there was shame and anguish that our Lord experienced. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. He endured what? The shame and the suffering of that cross. Every day when I get up, my mind ought to immediately... Go to the cross of Calvary. I've got to have cross awareness, folks. It's what made me who I am. And it's what's going to enable me to be who I desire to be. And it's going to enable me to go to the place where I want to go. When you think of the cross, there are many, many things that you can think about. Did you know that? The list that I'm about to give you is just a partial list, I'll guarantee you. But let's look at a few things. Number one, the love of God. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, what? Died for us. We just saw where He died. He died on the cross of Calvary. Folks, there was the greatest manifestation of love ever given, right there on the cross of Calvary. I love you so much that I don't want you to die. I'm going to let my son do it for you. What greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends, the Bible says. And yet Jesus did it for who? For enemies. Here's something that's interesting. I almost talked about this at a Wednesday night devotional, and I still may. When you look at the cross of Calvary, my friends, you see the wickedness of man. And what's amazing is, I'm not just talking about our personal sins. I'm talking about what went on that day. It was the darkest day in human history. As far as man is concerned. And it surprises me, not the least, that at 12 o'clock, Darkness came upon that land for three long hours, did it not? Here was man in his darkest state. Envy, hate, rebellion, injustice, sin, blasphemy against the Almighty God, against the very Son of the living God. It's not a pretty day in the history of man. When I look at the cross, I see sin, don't I? The Bible says that He was made sin for us who knew no sin. I also see payment. I see ransom being made. 
Jesus said, I give my life a ransom for many. That word ransom means payment. Jesus paid a debt that none of us could pay. There was no way that I could find enough money. There was no way that I could be good enough to pay my way out of the clutches of Satan. Only Jesus could pay the debt, and he did. Notice also, there was blood that was shed. There was guilt and innocence, wasn't there? Oh, Jesus was innocent of all charges. He was declared innocent, even by Pontius Pilate. I am free from the blood of this what? Just man. Really? Then you should let him go. But he didn't, did he? And yet there was guilt there, wasn't there? And the guilt was the guilt of our sins upon the cross of Calvary. There was suffering. There was shame. We've already talked about those. And folks, there was death that day by Jesus Christ. You see, when I think of the cross, I'm not just talking about a wooden cross beam. And I'm not just talking about seeing the Savior hanging there with blood dripping from His body. When I say you and I need to have cross awareness, I'm talking about we've got to have the awareness of everything that went on that day on the cross of Calvary. And it's overwhelming. But here's the point. We have to develop an appreciation and an understanding of it. It's been 2,000 years, hasn't it? That's a long time. I wonder if I could go back and put myself in the shoes of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then look at the cross. Would that make a difference? I don't know about you, but if it were my personal son that had died there, it would make a difference. And it would not be just a simple little act that we come together on the Lord's Day and think about during the Lord's Supper. It's got to be more than that. Those cross awareness is revolutionary. Cross awareness causes me to be radically different every day of my life. Cross awareness changes my mind, changes my emotion, changes my behavior, changes everything that there is about me. Notice what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Paul says that what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary is the thing that drives me. But notice what else he goes on to say. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Got a question for you. Did Jesus die for you? If you shake your head this way, guess what? Then you are dead in your sin. He died for you. But notice what he goes on to say. And that he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. But unto him that died and was raised again. Folks, if Jesus really died for me, then guess what? I do not live for myself anymore. I live every day for who? For him who died and rose again. You see, when I look at the cross and know what he did, it's almost impossible to be the same person, isn't it? I don't know if you've picked up on it or not, but in this lesson, what we've really been saying is this, cultivating the heart, involves a relationship with three beings. First of all, it involves a relationship with God. I've got to fear Him. I've got to hold Him in His place of honor and respect above all else. But notice also, we're talking about a relationship with... Uh, I'll get it here. 
I'm talking about a relationship with self, aren't we? Folks, I've got to crucify myself. I've got to put myself to death. And thirdly, there is a relationship with Jesus. Every day of my life, I wake up and I look at Him upon the cross of Calvary and appreciate everything that He's done. If you don't think about God, if you don't deal with self, and if you don't look at Jesus, you will never, ever cultivate a heart for God. If I were to pray one prayer, it would be the one that's above me. Father, give us a heart like David. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And that's true. Here's what's interesting. There's really only one passage that says that. Did you know that? You would think that that statement would be found several times in Scripture, and it's not. It's only said one time. And it's not in 1 Samuel chapter 13. In 1 Samuel 13, guess what's happened? Saul has sinned against God, and God says, I'm going to replace you. And here's what he tells Saul. I am going to seek after a man after mine own heart. Wow. Now, take yourself out of the 21st century and set yourself way back there in David's day. God says, I'm done with you, Saul. And I'm about to start a search throughout all mankind for guess what? A man after my heart. Now remember, David wasn't this great, powerful, well-known, majestic figure in Israel, was he? He wasn't even the oldest in the family. He was just a babe. When Samuel comes to anoint him, he's not even present. He's out there in the field tending stinky sheep. And folks, that's what happens. You stink like sheep when you work with sheep. And yet God searched all Israel. And what did He find? He found a little shepherd boy. And guess what? He says, there's the man after my own heart. Wow. Would He have found me? Acts 13, 22. An account is being given of Old Testament history. And listen to what the text says. I have what? Found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Did you hear what God said? I have what? I have found him. He looked and he found him. Folks, God's still looking. For men and women who have a heart like the heart of God. Can you honestly say that's the kind of heart you have this morning? Maybe this morning you've never obeyed the gospel. Your heart's far from God. You need to yield in obedience today. The steps are so simple. The plan is so easy, isn't it? You believe in the Christ, repent of sins, confess His name and are immersed for the remission of sins. Dear Christian, what about you? Can we all honestly stand up and say, I am a man after God's own heart, or woman. Maybe there's something in your life that causes you not to be able to say that. Maybe you need to repent of sin and ask God to forgive you. My friend, do you need to respond to this invitation? Make your heart. A heart that longs for God. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?